this video, I will be introducing ideas that are central to culturally competent and evidence-based tobacco use treatment. There are a variety of ways in which people use tobacco. Some people smoke cigarettes or BDs, while others use hookahs. Many people use smokeless tobacco products that release tobacco when the product is sucked or chewed. Unfortunately, all of these products cause increased risk for significant health problems such as cancer and cardiovascular disease. The World Health Organization estimates that tobacco use leads to more than 7 million deaths globally each year. Around 6 million of these deaths occur among current and former tobacco users, and nearly 1 million deaths occur due to exposure to secondhand smoke. Different frameworks for identifying tobacco use problems have been developed and are useful for summarizing the core features. According to the framework used in the DSM-5, individuals are diagnosed with tobacco use disorder when they meet at least two out of 11 possible specified symptoms within a 12-month period. Some common symptoms include a persistent desire or unsuccessful efforts to cut down or control tobacco use, and experiencing craving or a strong desire or urge to use tobacco. Other frequent symptoms include demonstrating tolerance for the nicotine and experiencing withdrawal symptoms when an individual makes an effort to stop using nicotine. Depending on the number of symptoms an individual is experiencing, the degree of severity may be classified as mild, moderate, or severe. A widespread misconception is that people who use tobacco don't want to quit. To the contrary, the reality is that worldwide, about 70% of people who smoke want to quit. Of those who try to quit without any cessation assistance, it's estimated that over 90% may be smoking again within a year. Thus, quitting tobacco use is extremely difficult to do alone, even if someone is fully motivated. As a result, it is critical to make evidence-based, culturally appropriate services available to support cessation from tobacco use. Like other types of mental and behavioral health care, the most effective treatments for tobacco use integrate the best available research, client characteristics, values, and preferences, and clinical expertise. Let's review each of these three components, starting with the available research on tobacco use treatment. The body of research suggests that the most effective tobacco use treatment seems to combine counseling and medication. That said, counseling and medication each are effective when deployed on their own. Counseling refers to a broad range of approaches. Effective counseling can be as short as one-time, three-minute advice, or be comprehensive, spanning multiple sessions to guide an individual through the entire process of quitting and relapse prevention. Evidence shows that even brief amounts of counseling contact can increase abstinence from tobacco. As the amount of counseling increases, abstinence rates increase as well. Effective counseling can be delivered through individual, group, telephone, and even self-help formats. The most common research-supported styles of counseling include motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral therapy. While most of the research on counseling has been conducted among Western samples, the benefits of brief advice and longer counseling have also been demonstrated in numerous studies in India. Effective medication approaches include nicotine replacement therapy, bupropion, and varenicline. Nicotine replacement therapy, or NRT, includes products that supply nicotine to an individual without the accompanying hazards that are also present in smoked or smokeless tobacco products. For instance, the nicotine patch delivers nicotine at a relatively constant rate 
to replace nicotine, which is the addictive substance present in tobacco. Forms of NRT, such as nicotine gum and nicotine lozenges, are sometimes useful to replace nicotine while addressing other challenges, such as acute cravings for nicotine. Most NRT products can be obtained without a doctor's prescription in many countries. Bupropion, also marketed as Zyban or Welbutrin, among other names, and Varenicline, also marketed as Chantix, are prescription medications that are effective for stopping tobacco use. These medications should be prescribed and monitored by a medical professional. Across all of the medications that are mentioned, there are different profiles of advantages, disadvantages, and side effects that should be considered on a case-to-case -case basis, paying special attention to cost and the individual's characteristics and preferences. Next, let's turn to client characteristics, values, and preferences. When evaluating clients' tobacco use, clinicians should ask questions to assess clients' values and preferences related to tobacco use in particular. For instance, it is important to understand clients' beliefs about why they engage in tobacco use, their perceived costs and benefits to use, their perceived barriers to quitting, the perceived impact of tobacco use on them and their family, and perceptions of others in their community regarding each of these facets. More work is needed to understand the effects of culturally adapted tobacco cessation outside of the United States. However, several components of existing adaptations to tobacco cessation stand out. To maximize effectiveness, clinicians can infuse culturally informed assessment throughout an entire intervention, incorporate the sociocultural values of an individual's community, and involve supportive members of clients' community whenever possible. An important note about tobacco treatment is that it does not seem to harm the success of other substance use treatments. In fact, evidence from largely Western, racially diverse samples suggests the opposite in many cases. Stopping tobacco use may increase sustained abstinence from other substances. Many providers and clients may hesitate to introduce tobacco treatment because they are worried about disrupting other ongoing treatment. In fact, the research I've just summarized, along with the dangers posed by continuing tobacco use, are a powerful argument for adding tobacco treatment to the agenda in a culturally informed manner. Not every client is equally likely to be a tobacco user, as tobacco use rates vary tremendously according to factors like income level, race, and the presence of co-occurring mental illnesses. For instance, in the United States, people from lower socioeconomic statuses are more likely to smoke, a correlation that is mirrored in many countries. People from lower socioeconomic statuses also are less likely to succeed when trying to quit smoking, despite attempting to quit at similar rates to the rest of the United States smoking population. In India, the pattern may be more complex, as forms of tobacco use, such as BDs, cigarettes, and smokeless tobacco, may relate to markers of socioeconomic status in different directions. These findings across the U.S. and India demonstrate how culturally sensitive work with tobacco use is critical for understanding the experiences, meanings, beliefs, and social context of tobacco use for each individual user. Research suggests that on average, men and women may experience unique challenges around tobacco use and quit attempts. In cultures that promote a thin ideal for women, tobacco may be used as an appetite suppressant. People who use tobacco often have a lower body weight than those who don't. So quitting tobacco means potentially gaining weight. The average weight gain that occurs after a successful quit attempt is almost double what American women report being willing to tolerate 
before starting an attempt. Further, tobacco companies have emphasized these themes in their marketing aimed toward women, promoting images of slimness, independence, and fashion and glamour. There are also known differences in the way individuals' bodies metabolize nicotine. For instance, on average, American individuals with predominantly European ancestry may metabolize nicotine faster than Americans with predominantly African or Asian ethnicity. More evidence is needed to confirm these patterns and identify metabolism patterns in other global populations. However, nicotine metabolism, speed, may promote the development of dependence while impacting other features of tobacco use, such as how reinforcing each use of tobacco is. Again, assessing the impact and meaning of each tobacco use for a client is useful for a provider when understanding and adapting treatment. Finally, let's talk about clinical expertise and resources. Clinical expertise is one significant resource for aligning information about individuals' cultural background, the research evidence, and also practical resources available for tobacco use treatment. The variety of effective approaches to tobacco treatment lends itself well to tailoring to individual backgrounds and the needs of the situation. In communities where there is limited financial support and personnel, self-help and technology-driven resources such as telephone quit lines, internet interventions, and mobile phone support have shown promise in assisting clients with quit attempts. Technology resources can be matched to clients' needs and used in tandem with other treatment approaches or used as standalone treatments. Thank you for watching this video. I hope that you can use it as a starting point to build your knowledge about culturally competent and evidence-based tobacco use treatment.